It's one of those stories that allows you to find personal ways in. And I always find that with genre work, the important thing for me is to find a personal avenue into something. I have to be able to relate to the character. And Batman as a character, I'm certainly not Batman, <laughs> but he's a very human character. And he's very, um, the story is a very psychological one. He's basically coping with things that happened to him as a child. and. He's driven to try and make sense of his life. And for me, that's what movie making is, right? You, you go and you try to tell stories because in doing so, you're kind of making order and sense of the world. And I, for me, I started doing that as a kid. I started making eight millimeter movies when I was eight years old. And it was sort of my, my tool of socialization. That's how I met people. But also the telling of the stories and trying to find ways to make sense of things through little stories, that's just something I've always loved. And the Batman story, I think is, it's such a, it's an, the, the, the story has endured for, for 80 years. I mean, obviously it's a character that connects to people. And I think part of the reason that he connects is, you know, there's the suit and there's the car, there's the gadgets, he's super cool. But there's something about the fact that he's not really a superhero. Under all of that, he's just a human being and he's driven to try and make sense of his life and that human side of him makes him very approachable. He doesn't have superpowers. What he has is a super heroic drive to try to make the world better, but he doesn't even do that totally in an altruistic sense. He's doing it because what happened to him is something he's never gonna get over, and he's trying to find some way to, to make a difference in this place. Because I wasn't doing an origin story and because we were beginning the story again, I wanted to do a story where the character Batman had an arc. I wanted to do an imperfect Batman. It's part of why I wanted it to be year two, because I wanted him to not have figured out how to be Batman yet. And so you wouldn't see the origins, but you knew that he was being driven by something that came from the origin story that everybody knew. And I wanted to set him into a, a mode that hadn't been quite done. Somewhere early in the writing, this idea of him not saying, I'm Batman, and that he'd been referred to as this vigilante who takes on the name, the Batman, to the city, that's what he represents to the city, that he, in this early stage, is not yet known by the city. So he's actually, at this stage in his career, kind of a frightening figure to the city. And so I didn't want him to announce that he was Batman. I wanted them to give him the name of being the Batman because he goes around in this bat costume. And I wanted him to use that phrase that is so much in so many of the comics, which is for him to say, I'm vengeance, because this is a personal mission. This whole thing starts really because of what happened to him as a child. And what he's doing is he's taking out his vengeance for what happened to him. And he is playing that against the criminal element. A friend of mine directed a movie, James Gray, who's a friend of mine since film school, I think is a very talented filmmaker. He made a movie called The Lost City of Z. And I remember him telling me that he had cast Rob in the movie. And when he showed me the movie, because we always share our, the cuts of movies with each other, and he showed me the movie, and I had forgotten that he cast Rob, and Rob came in, and in the movie, he has this enormous beard, and he's unlike any version of Rob you've ever seen in any movie, and he had such charisma, and I was like, my God, who is that guy? And I, it just, I really just took a mental note. I thought, oh my God, that's, that's Rob Pattinson. How interesting, he's like a chameleon. And then I just started watching a bunch of movies, and every time he was in a movie, he was totally different. And one of the movies that somebody suggested that I might take a look at during this was Good Time, the Safdie Brothers movie. And in that movie, I saw something that to me really connected to Batman, which was in the movie, Rob is very, um, you can feel his desperation and you can feel his drive. And I felt that this Batman has a kind of desperate drive to try and make things right. And it's like an impossible task. He's so driven. He's, it's almost like a drug. He just is pushed to do it. And the other thing though, was that I saw within that a level of vulnerability. And I wanted this version of the character 
to be driven, to be scary, but I also wanted to see his vulnerability. I wanted, I felt there was a chance here by making it this intimate and this psychological with him, not in his origins, but in what it was to be in the city right now, in this fight to try and make a difference in the city, for the story to be the most emotional Batman that, that had been committed to film. And when I saw all the different aspects that Rob brought to that role, I was like, I really think it's Rob. And so I started writing with him in mind. And I had no idea because he'd been doing really interesting work since Twilight. He ended up doing, he would seek out filmmakers, right? So he was working with Claire Denis and he worked with my friend James and he found the Safdie brothers and David Cronenberg, like just really interesting filmmakers. And one thing I had no idea as I was writing this was, is Rob gonna have any interest in playing Batman? Will he want to come back to do a blockbuster film? And something very strange happened, which was that it turned out that Rob had had a love of Batman since he was a kid. And in fact, I think on one of the um, Twilight commentaries, I believe he does a Batman voice when he's with Christian Stewart. And um, I didn't know any of this, but I, I, I found this all out later. But it turned out that he, once he found out that I was doing the movie, was actually um, pursuing the movie from his side because he was very interested to know, oh, what's this new iteration of Batman gonna be? And so it just was sort of faded. I love to go on a search where you do a lot of takes because I come with a plan and I work out my shots and I work out all the beats and I have a very clear vision of the movie in my head. When I'm writing, I'm really making the movie for the first time on paper and you just keep remaking it and remaking it and remaking it. And when you come to the set on the day, you have all that with you, but you have to put it aside if you're really going to find something that's alive because you could have someone just do X, Y, and Z exactly as you do it, but then I really become an emotional compass and I am there to provoke and to lead and to guide and to sort of say, ah, oh, you know what, compass-wise, we're off track. So let me, let's try to go over here, but I want all of the actors to bring themselves to it. And so I like to go on this search, I do a lot of takes. If this wasn't going to be an origin story for Batman, it was going to be an origin story in a way for any of the rogues gallery characters that I brought in because in the comics, they were inspired really to become who they were because of the appearance of this masked vigilante. And so I thought, well, almost like an old Warner Brothers gangster movie, I thought if he, as he's trying to, to go through this, the kind of uh, fabric that is Gotham and turn down the different alleys um, and meet with various different criminals and gangsters the way that you would in an old classic um, Warner Brothers gangster movie. You meet Sidney Greenstreet or, you know, any of those characters that I thought it would be a way to cross paths with the various different rogues gallery characters. And I knew that one that was very important to me was Selena Kyle. I wanted, I thought that she was a very powerful counterpoint to who Batman was, that Batman Batman is very privileged because, you know, as traumatic as what happened to him was, he has the safety net of coming from a storied and rich family. I mean, being a vigilante is really kind of a luxury. You know, it doesn't mean that everybody would choose to do it, but you could only choose to do it if you have the resources to do it, and he does. And I wanted to f create a Selena Kyle and draw from the comics to, to, to bring a Selena Kyle to life who had a a similar upbringing to him, meaning that she had experienced trauma in her youth, but she didn't have any of the things that he had, and that she was a survivor, and that she was this kind of a mirror image of him, and but didn't have any of the things that he had, and that she would, as a result of that, challenge him and he her. And so I thought, oh, these two characters, they relate to each other by their differences and by the things in which they share. You know, when you think about it, a bat signal is not the most practical or realistic way to try to reach someone. So I wanted to think about its meaning. And what I thought was interesting was, again, I was trying to think about Batman's arc through the movie and that he starts as vengeance. And I thought, well, if he's out there as a vigilante that criminals know is gonna appear out of the shadows at any moment, anytime you see that symbol, it's a message that says he's out there. It means vengeance is out there. It means that he could be coming for you, so you better watch out. And so that it started putting this message of fear into the sky. And that was really, I think, what was important to me was that the bat symbol and the bat signal could go from being a message of fear, and then over the course of the movie, that Batman would then step out into the light by the end and that he could take his first steps 
to being a figure that maybe could be a message of hope that people who were, because you know, in the beginning, the idea is that not only are the criminals afraid of him, but frankly, the city is afraid of him as well, because you just don't know where that line is. And so when, when the bat signal is in the sky, that's frightening to the general inhabitants of the city too, because you just don't know. When a guy decides to take the law into his own hands, you don't know where that's gonna end. And by the end of the story, I wanted the bat signal to evolve to a place where it might start to mean something different. And so that was important to me. It was part of his arc. Because he worked so much by himself, I wanted him to be a really effective street fighter. And I wanted him to have a version of, of misc martial arts where he'd adapted various forms just out of efficiency in order to be able to survive on the streets. And when I was looking for a stunt person, um, I met with Rob Alonzo and he and I just really connected. And he, he was a fighter. And um, so it was exciting because I could talk to him. I, of course, am not a fighter. And so I could talk to him psychologically about what I was looking for. And he could give me some insight as to how that might manifest in terms of the moves that he would do. You know, in a lot of the other movies, people just accept Batman as Batman, or like the comics, they just accept, oh, hey, he's here. But this was a world in which Batman was not yet accepted. And so finding the tone in these first few days was a critical part of the process. And, and Rob, finding what his voice sounded like, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, Rob has an incredible gift to be able to alter his voice. And we went on this search where, through the exploration, I discovered he could lower his voice. And I didn't want him to do that kind of classic Batman growl. I didn't want that. I felt like we'd seen that, and I just felt like ours shouldn't do that. I wanted you to be able to relate to him in a way where he felt very human. And so he had this thing where he was able to drop his voice to a certain register, and it was very interesting and haunting. And I thought, ah, oh, I think that's Batman, because the idea was to get very inside his head. And one of the things that Rob and I talked about in this scene was the idea of him coming into the scene almost like a shaman almost like a spiritualist, like he becomes very instinctual. So many people are looking at him that he has to block them out. And he has, because he's masked and no one knows who he is, he gets into this state that's very sort of ins instinctual, very almost spiritual. And so that voice was kind of born out of that idea. He moved through the scene almost like an apparition, almost like a ghost. And that sort of experience, these first few days, we actually went over in these first few days because we were just trying to figure out what does this Batman movie feel like? And shooting this scene was really, really challenging and ultimately sort of set the tone of the whole movie. Gotham needed to be a real place and we wanted to shoot in a place that had real historic Gothic architecture. And then we were gonna add all of this extension to it. So you were gonna go, gosh, what is this metropolis? I've never seen this before. We wanted to create our own Gotham so you felt that you were seeing a place that looked like a big city and a big American city that had Gothic, Gothic architecture, but a city at the same time that you'd never seen before, a city that was ours, 